Hi, this is David Summerfleck again, and thank you for watching another episode of Rebooting Business. This particular episode is a video uh, only episode. It's a video version of an audio podcast that I had done quite some time ago when this podcast was originally called uh, Blue Monday. So in this podcast episode, I basically try to help a rabbi reach more of the faithful, be more present as a father and as a husband and live the life that he always wanted to live. So I wanted to repackage this as a video because I felt like it could have some helpful uh, information for those out there watching. So please watch this. If you find it helpful or have questions, please post them down below in the comments section. And as always, to get in touch, you can reach me at www.dms.blue. And thanks again for watching. and by America's small business owners. To get future episodes as soon as they drop or apply to be a guest, visit dms.blue. And thank you for listening to Blue Monday. This is your host, David Summerfleck. I am a digital marketing specialist with approximately 20 years experience as a digital marketing specialist and also working as a small business mentor for several nonprofit organizations. And in this podcast, I basically try to help small business owners, entrepreneurs, nonprofit founders, and other business owners basically kickstart their business and get the results that they want. So in this particular episode, my wonderful guest is Rabbi. Hello there. Hello there. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you today, David. Thank you. Can you please um, tell us your name and your background and education and all that great stuff? Sure. So I am Rabbi Iman Glazer. I'm in Silver Spring, Maryland, and I grew up all over the Northeast, mostly, and throughout the U.S., and I you know, went to college in New York City, high, public high schools, and Jewish high schools before that. York City, and then eventually decided to become a rabbi, and, and, and did that training for a good, took me about four years to do that, and uh, served in congregations for six years, and now I'm on a freelance entrepreneurial journey. And Now, rabbi, if I may, what made you, well, first of all, what did you do before you became a rabbi, and then what made you want to become one? Sure. And I grew up in synagogues and Jewish day schools and summer camp and youth groups. And so it was a very, on one level, it was following in, in dad's footsteps. But on another level, I have always loved to teach and I love to inspire people. And I do my best thinking and my best creative work when I'm teaching. I don't like to be, you know, I'm, I'm a better teacher than I am a student. And so appreciated the fact that when I taught, even when I was in high school, I could interact with people and help them find meaning and healing and wisdom and some support for whatever it was they were going through. And I just, I had a sense from even when I was 16 or 17 that I wanted to, to be a rabbi as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm certainly glad I did. And I, you know, my, my vision originally had been to follow in dad's footsteps and be a congregational rabbi for many, many years, just like he was. I did that for, for six years, and now I've taken a different shift out of out of the congregational world and into this more entrepreneurial journey. Those, those six years, how were those um, in, in terms of just you know doing what you really love and feeling be, feeling fulfilled? Well, I will say that my first two years were in a small congregation in northern New Jersey, and I was. I was brought in, I had been a high holiday rabbi with them 
for for the for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the holidays for three years in a row, and then they hired me to to try and to turn the place around a little bit, and I was able to do some of that. But ultimately, I was spending a lot of time with people in their seventies, eighties, and nineties, and it was it was incredibly isolating. Mm. On a large okay. Jewish community there, and certainly not of young people. These were really the the people who who had refused to move to Florida in an old. People and I, 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 it, it helped me a lot, and I was able to, you know, I became a rabbi while I was working at that place, and they, I was able to grow. And then my 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 following co- my second congregation was in Memphis, Tennessee, and it was much bigger, two hundred and fifty families. And I loved teaching, and I loved interacting with people, and I loved bringing a positive Jewish presence. And and while this may sound odd to people, I loved being able to be a comforting presence at funerals and in sad times, but also in happier times and, and, and weddings and baby namings and bar bucketfuls. And I, I really, I do miss some of that work and being able to, to journey with people in their in, in their life choices and destinations. And I loved I loved to teach and I loved to learn. And I was really, you know, I had a I had a place that was. Synagogue, but it was a place that I, I, I had a nice role there, and it was, it was complicated. But there was there was a lot to like there, and I sure you know, I, I, I left there after getting divorced, and after realizing that again, I was doing a lot of good work for people in their sixties, seventies, and eighties, a few ninety-year-olds, and the grandchildren or great-grandchildren. But I realized that I was, you know, especially after I got divorced, I realized that I was I was lonely and I was isolated. When I took myself out for dinner and a blues concert on my birthday alone, I said, this is not acceptable, right? I may be doing good work here and these may be good people here, but I just don't have the community that I need. And, right, right. and I, I had started dating someone long distance and things progressed and we ended up getting married a year and a half ago and I decided to make the graduation. Thank you, appreciate that. I decided that uh, I was I was ready to take a break from this full time congregational work. It's a little bit exhausting to to always be on and to be you know to be a spiritual guide for that many people. And it's 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 not an easy business to be in. I will say we don't we don't always treat our our, our clergy well and with the greatest of respect. Many people do, but it's it's a busy job, right? It's a busy job. And, you know, you do, you're listening to problems all day long For sure. uh, on a regular basis. I could not do it. I would probably go bonkers. <laughs> um, to, and that's being very, uh, very generous. Sure. So let me ask you, how did you transition from where you were there to where you are now? And if you can help me better understand, sure. what is it? what is it you're doing now? Because... It's entrepreneurial, but it's different. You've got a lot of different things going on. Right. So admittedly, I will tell you, so it's, it's two years ago this week that I that I made the move. And it has not exactly been the two years that I thought it would be. And what I mean yeah. by that is when I, when I moved, what I thought the plan was, was that I would move, I would take a little time off to get married, to get settled, to launch the Motivational Jewish Podcast, to finish the coach certification training I had started, hang up my coaching single shingle, and the world would flock to my door and I could ride off into the sunset helping people live better lives. And uh, mm. I dare say that's not exactly how the last two years have gone. I did, I did get married and I'm very happy about that. More boxes are unpacked, and that's a good thing. And um, I did launch the podcast, and I did finish the coaching certification. And the week after we got married, my dad went into the hospital and was eventually diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, and ended up oh. passing away a year ago. And oh, so I, I'm sorry to hear that. That's a, so you, I mean, I don't want to stop what you're saying because I want to know the rest. Sure, but. As you know, the rabbi who listens to people every day, you've got to acknowledge 
and apply what you say to others to yourself. Of course. It's a, tr- it's a tremendous amount to go through in a very short period of time. It, it, it absolutely was. And I'll, uh, you know, when, you know, the week he died, I went from my, my mother's mother turned 100 and we had a big celebration for her. And he and I had spent the last two months with him. I was able to go to my grandmother's party, and he died that afternoon. Buried him, did the full week of Shiva of Jewish mourning, and mm-hmm. then the next day went on our honeymoon. And it was, uh, it was, it was a very crazy time. And it, it, it took, you know, not a small ounce of, uh, of work to get through it all and to just be present at each of those different things. And I will say that... You know, I, I'm grateful that I had the time and the space to be with Dad for the for the few months as as he was you know nearing his end, and I was able to do that healing work that I kept telling other people they should do. It. And I, I'm very grateful to have that time. And I know that had I stayed, had I been you know working full time in a congregation, there's no way I would have been would have had the time to, to do that work. And I'm I'm grateful that things worked out as they did. And. Um, so that that certainly took up a lot of a lot of my time as it needed to. And you know, the, the, the... Rabbi, after that happened, I mean, did you have time to just decompress? I mean, to, to deal with you know the loss and the changes and everything, just to process it emotionally. Well, I'm grateful that my my father again. He was also a rabbi, and he was also a grief specialist. And he actually hosted a grief radio show that I was able to listen to right after he died. And it was a, it was a very interesting, a little bit bizarre way to still connect to him and hear his wisdom. And he, in his own way, through his show, was helping me grieve his own death. And that was really powerful, unique. And, and again, I was able to spend you know most of the previous two months before he died with him. savor that time and those conversations that we had together i will say that i you know by the time i got to the to the funeral and then there's this week of mourning and you know everybody's worn out because everybody wants to come over and bring food and talk to you or not and uh, I, w- I was very grateful that uh, my wife and i had, had had previously booked our honeymoon for six months after the after the wedding and i was very grateful after the week of mourning ended to go on a cruise and not have my cell phone available to anyone and it was a uh, it was very helpful for both of us to yeah. have that time together and to you know okay i was sad i was in mourning but you know it was time for us to be together and, and heal as well so you know again needless to say the journey that i thought i was on is not exactly the journey that i that that happened and you know life happens that way and and, and they don't teach that in in rabbinical school i mean sometimes they do but they probably don't teach it in entrepreneurial school that sometimes things get in the way and, and we just have to roll with it and, and find the beauty wherever we can. And I'm, I'm grateful to have done so. So when I, when I got back, you know, from the honeymoon and really getting settled again, you know, after his death, you know, I started, you know, I did, I, I joined the National Speakers Association. They have a DC chapter that meets, um, you know, one day a month and things like that. Uh, it's a 10 minute walk from my house and I had been in, very involved with Toastmasters in Memphis and, and became a distinguished Toastmaster at their highest level and really loved it and, and I joined in lots of speakers and coaches Facebook groups and, and my, my NSA and my coaching friends they all said well if you want to be anyone in the world and if you want to make it as a speaker or as a coach you have to write a book mm-hmm. and I said well that's good. I'm sorry, no, it's fine. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, so they said I had to write a book. And I, I was thinking to myself, well, which book do I write? Because there were actually, I've been wanting to write books for a while, but I never did. And they asked me questions. They said, well, what what really angers you? What and, and, and what kind of impact do you think you could have? And I, and I sat with those questions for a bit, and... You know, my journey over the last almost five years now has been not just, you know, as a rabbi and not just as a son burying his father and as a newlywed and a, and as a husband, 
but also a journey of recovery from addiction. And I spent almost the last five years, you know, very heavily focused on my own addiction and recovery. And I decided that, you know, as, I was, as I was looking around the Jewish world, there were very few resources available to Jews in recovery and those struggling with addiction and their loved ones. And I decided that this was really an area where I could make an impact and help change the narrative. And I decided that this would be the book that I would write. And amazingly enough, I did. <laughs> what was the book? So the book is called And God Created Recovery, Jewish Wisdom to Help You Break Free from Your Addiction, Heal Your Wounds, and Unleash Your Inner Freedom. Okay. So you, were you personally in recovery yes. for addiction? Yes, I am in recovery from addiction and, and, and have been so for a number of years now. And and the book is my attempt to blend my recovery side, my rabbi side, and my coaching side with a few other modalities I've studied. And to, I wanted to write the book that I wish had been written beforehand so that while I was going through my journey of recovery, I would have someone show me the way. For you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, something that, that you need and, uh, or, or, or could have benefited from. So that's really good. So what became of the book? Um, and then I want to ask you some other questions. Sure. So the book is now out. It's done. It's live on Amazon, which is great. And I have started to, to sell some copies and get on podcasts and be interviewed. And, and a number of communities are starting to bring me in as a guest speaker or a scholar in residence. And I've presented at a number of conferences. And every time I open my mouth and talk about addiction within the Jewish world, people come up to me and they say, thank you so much for sharing this. We feel so isolated and alone because we're not talking about this and nobody's yeah. giving us resources that we would like. And that really keeps me inspired to keep doing this work. I mean, it's not, it's not easy work to build a business and to talk about suffering and addiction and wounds and healing all day long. But I do that because in the power of healing and I believe that you know it's long past time for the Jewish world and other parts of the world too right it's not only our problem but it's really time for all of us to stand up and say we've been silent about this and other issues for way too long we need to heal yeah Jewish guilt is you know I, I guess I'm what you call a non-practicing Jew okay uh, where you know you you understand uh, you know the the ethnic Jew uh, background, I guess. I, I, but I, you, know, you identify, you understand, you have mountains of empathy. Uh, but certainly, one of the things that you you learn very early on is that, yeah, in the Jewish community, there is not a lot of support if you're if you're recovering from addiction or, or what have you. You've got no choice, really. You go to the rabbi or you deal with it. So it's interesting. I, I started a Facebook group for, for Jews in Recovery and their loved ones and people want to learn about this. And I asked them recently, yeah. and I said, what stops you from talking to your rabbi about your addiction? And the responses that I got back were, were one of two things, mostly. People said either that the, the shame and the stigma of being an addict mm -hmm. it often pre prevents a lot of people from getting help, and it, it, it's unfortunate. And the second one is they, they, people said that they didn't actually think their rabbi would know anything about the subject. And unfortunately, it's probably true for a lot of rabbis out there that this is just not an area that rabbinical schools have touched on. And it's one of the things that I, that I want to change while doing this work is to you know, have mandatory trainings in every rabbinical school in the country and Again, not just this. We need to be talking about domestic violence. We need to be talking about mental health. We need to be talking about, you know, caregiving and the impact that makes on so many people. And we, you know, it's, you know, the old, the old Jewish saying is, uh, you know, in Yiddish they would say a shikar is a goy, which means, you know, a drunk is a non-Jew, which is, which is their way of saying Jews don't have these problems. And of course we have these problems. We've had this problem, you know, since the beginning of time. And there are stories of you know, Jews acting inappropriately, you know, since the Bible sure. and, and, and certainly later on. And and again, just like every other people, we're no different in this regard, right? But this culture that says, oh, this is not our problem, really is, is harmful to a lot of people. 
It's not related to business or marketing directly, but I have to ask, why is that training not there? Or why was it was it not there? It's a good question. I think that... I mean, is there, is, is there just too much emphasis on Torah and not enough on applying it? I think that... I'll say a couple things. I think that there is still incredible shame and stigma about being being in recovery or being in addiction in the Jewish world. And again, not just in the Jewish world. This happens in, in, in many faith communities. And, and there's a sense that we don't talk about our wounds publicly. And I think that's a lot of, you know, sort of internalized oppression over the years. And you know, it's better to just keep quiet and hope that nobody pays attention to us. Because unfortunately, there's a legacy of sometimes when people speak up, they get hurt or killed. Yeah. And, and I think there's a very real reluctance to, to, to bring our less than perfect size in the, in the public view. I also think that traditionally rabbinical schools train scholars. And I think the model of the rabbinate is actually shifting today towards more pastoral work, towards more spiritual guidance and less of the, you know, what they, what they say, less the, less the sage from on high, but sort of the, the guide on the side, right? The one who, who you can Right. To, you can help you with and people want empathy people want empathy they want a sense of yes this guy can quote Torah to me but he can also help me deal with these feelings of being frustrated at work or, or, or dealing with an addiction issue or, or what have you right I could I could care less if somebody knows which page and which prayer we're supposed to stand up for and which one to sit down yeah. for right I, I really it doesn't like I, I mean you know it's helpful but i really don't care at the end of the day i want people to know that they matter in the world that they're important to the jewish people mm -hmm. and and in, in my eyes and in god's eyes and i want people to know that they're they're valued i think we are so lacking in hope today the world we live in is overwhelming to so many people myself sometimes included I, I think that's the important question is, do we matter? And does anyone care about us? And and do the choices we make impact other people? And, and what does it mean to be happy and healthy and holy and in, in this topsy-turvy world we live in? Those are the important questions. And that's, you know, more and more rabbis are starting to talk about that. But the training is not quite there yet. Yeah. Well, let's switch gears if you're all right sure. with that. I'd like to find out where are you now? And I have to ask you because it's not clear to me. How, I mean, first of all, you've got to be able to pay your rent or your mortgage and support your family. And I have no doubt that you do. So how are you doing that? And then let's talk about your business sure. and what you're doing now. So the business is, you know, still being built as we speak, but uh, the business that I am building, right, the way I see this going is the book is out, the really? Facebook group is started, I have done not nearly enough marketing for either, but I'm, I'm working on that, and what I see next, is, what I'm really trying to build for, from a financial standpoint, is I want to do things. I want to do a number of things, right? First, all right, my overarching goal is to help change the narrative in the Jewish world, to give resources, to give support for Jews in recovery and their loved ones and Jewish educators and everybody else I can possibly reach, right? That's sort of the external goal. Internally, the way I'm going to support my wife and God willing our family someday is I, I, I am creating a coaching program. I've got a few coaching clients already and I'm working on a few more. And putting together the you know the the video tutorials through the book and through other aspects of recovery, and I think that you know the coaching program, the, the Jewish recovery podcast that I haven't yet created, but it's getting closer, and you know in person retreats and events and trainings and an annual sober Jewish cruise every summer, right? I think that's going to be how I how I support all of this. I am getting teaching opportunities, so uh, communities are bringing me in as a scholar in residence or you know, one-off event to 
talk about my work and sell the book and so that is bringing in some income and helping me support the family currently and there's a lot more to do. Okay, so that's good. So okay, you're in a good place. Foundation, you're able to do what you need to do. Um, so it, the, the question then becomes, how do you build this, right? Right, and I'm always looking at, uh, you know, I will say that I am, I am more well versed in the teaching side of things and the coaching side of things and learning the marketing side of things is a whole different language that I didn't really have to speak in the same way when I was a congregational rabbi or when I was just an educator somewhere. Right. right? It's a it's an interesting world of branding and marketing and funnels and. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and, and all of that, and, and, yeah. and it's, you know, I, I, it's taken me a while, but I'm understanding it all now, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's starting to happen, which is nice. And, and, and I'll tell you, the, the two of the biggest things that I see, um, you get this owners, entrepreneurs, and I mean, you could say nonprofit, entrepreneur, small business, startup to me they're they're all the same you're trying to do something that you believe in that you feel called to do on some level whatever that may be and the goal is to have financial self-sufficiency to be able to support a family if that's not your goal that it's a hobby we don't have anything to talk about you know what i mean you just do it in your spare time so the idea is to Basically, the, the, the two biggest problems I see is that people are trying to do everything themselves, but don't have training or experience in the things that they're trying to do. So it's like uh, people who are struggling and they're restaurant owners. Well, who, you know, who had training in how to run a restaurant? Nobody. Well, that's part of it, you know or they go and buy a franchise or something, but they have no prior business experience or what have you. So trying to do too much by yourself, for yourself, without any prior experience in all of these different areas where you try to grow your business, manage your personal life, and on top of it, learn how to run the bit, you know, how to, how to program SEO, uh, how to build, you know, what, what does a professional looking website look like? How can I tell mine looks professional as opposed to something generic that won't capture anyone's interest? So there's all these different things. And then the other thing that's related to that is looking at the individual pieces of the puzzle as opposed to the puzzle it's, itself as a whole. So what I hear, first of all, and I could be mistaken, and if I am, I'd I have confidence you'll you'll tell me. It sounds like you've got so many different things going on, which is good because usually I hear people say I don't they don't have anything going on. So you got a lot. That's great. But I would want to put some structure to that and some sense of order so that you have if you don't already, I would want you to have a marketing plan saying, Okay, here's what Rabbi Elon wants to do. And then we're, we're going to clarify that. Then we're going to achieve the central objective, which is to promote this business and, you know, reach self sufficiency. We have to have different tiers or strategies to implement this, if that makes sense. So the analogy I use is I grew up, uh, my dad was in the Navy for like 30 around bases and military people. And one of the things that I really came to respect from a lot of military people was this need for heavy organization and structure, top down or bottom up, whatever, but lots of structure so that nobody ever goes and does something without some idea or some game plan. And if so that if this if plan A doesn't work, we have plan B. If plan B becomes too expensive or doesn't deliver the metrics we want, now we go to plan C. So, like they say, failure is not an option. Well, why is it not an option? Because we've got all these different strategies in place. We know the central objective. Now we have different strategies to achieve this. 
one of those strategies that I work with clients on is the digital marketing aspect. And what usually happens is people will fixate on the tools or the pieces of the puzzle and say, well, I need a website. And, and that's great, but the website in and of itself doesn't do anything. It's so the SEO, the social media, the content, the redistribution plan, the branding, all of those need to go through the website as if it were like a portal or a hub. And that's why when the internet began in the 90s, they started calling websites portals for online presence because it's, it's basically an automated marketing plan, right? If, does that kind of resonate yeah, with you all? So what have you done in terms of putting together a marketing plan? What have I done to put together a marketing plan? Yeah, it's funny you should mention. Is that, is that unfair? No, you can ask me anything. It's a totally fair question. And I'm, 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 not... <laughs> I'm not going to ask you anything, but I want to make sure that um, – you know, you, you, you feel like, hey, you know, I, I can, I know what to uh, to say in response to that. But is, is there a plan or is it just more a case of, I'm just going to try different things and eventually some of the rice is going to stick to the wall? So admittedly, you know, I'm, I'm laughing because I have a number of, of, of coaches and people I work with. And, and, sure. and, and every time I have a conversation like this, they're all saying the same thing, right? So I know that I'm, I'm, I'm getting there when everybody's saying the same thing. And I'm like, all right, all right, I'll do it already. I, I think it's... Um... Well, I mean, the, the thing is, and you know this, because you, you talk to other addicts and you talk to people in recovery and people from all different aspects of life, you get out with you in. Oh, sure. And that's probably in the Torah somewhere that you get out what you put in on a spiritual basis as well. And I, I mean, I could talk to you about spirituality all day long. I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, but you get out what you put in. And ultimately, if you don't have an organized, deliberate, structured plan that you're working from, then that's basically what happens. You're just kind of throwing rice at the wall. Some of it will stick. Some of it won't. You know, you did you create this group, but then it's not what's happening with it may or may not be what you want. Well, there's reasons for sure. that because you have to slow down and kind of say, let me look at this first and build the foundation. What's my brand identity? What type of content am I going to create? How will I create it? What will my SEO be? How do I know? What should my website look like? How do I know that? If I want to generate results, how do I budget? How do I know that? How can I tell the person I'm working with is professional and experienced? It, it, so you need to get answers to these questions and then say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to commit. For sure. And, and these, are, these are the questions that are very real for me. And it's, it's, it's certainly true that, I mean, I will say this, there is a plan. It's basically in my head, but it, it keeps getting, you know, more clear every time I have these conversations and and I think that it's you know I can absolutely see the process from the book to the Facebook group to the podcast to the coaching program to the retreats right? I, can, I can see all that happening and I, and I know that this is a viable a, a viable approach to financial sustainability and I, and I know this because people are, are already bringing in and, and some starting to come yeah. in which is lovely and I'm identifying the foundation and the tools that I could put in place and, and, and putting yeah. in the, yeah. the email software and the CRM and, and, and budget and, and all of that is, is, is absolutely where I'm at right now because, because I can't do it all just, you know, spur of the moment on the top of my head. It needs to be a little more structured. Yeah. Hey, right, and yeah, and, and deliberate. So that everything you do, it has a usefulness beyond what is Before, well, let's put it this way, when I first began speaking and presenting to groups, I didn't really feel comfortable on camera because I'm thinking, well, I'm not exactly Brad Pitt. I got to deal with the hand I've been dealt, you know, and um, I wish I had all of those previous talks on video 
and on audio and, and, and photos of all of those engagements, all of those meetings, because my goodness gracious, my website would be overflowing with videos and MP3s and, and, and you know photos of me meeting politicians and talking and schmoozing and so on that I never did just because I wasn't comfortable doing it at the time, not thinking, hey, look, later you can go in and you can edit these things. You can Photoshop away the, you know, the five o'clock shadow or the, the, the chart sure. or whatever. You, know, um, you can audit video so it, it comes out more coherent. Um, so every time that you give a speaking presentation, every time that you, you go to a meeting, there should be photos, there should be a podcast, there should be a video. And it's the concept of repurposing. Um, but again, that's separate from the organized, deliberate plan, the foundation. So as an example of what I'm saying, you know, your speaking would be one division or strategy level of a marketing plan. So that every time you go and speak, you've got a photographer, you've got a videographer, you've got uh, you know, someone, you know, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Where they write, they, they, uh, and they write down everything that you're saying verbatim. Uh, you know, they take that down. Um, or you're recording it and then having it done later because that could be used as a blog. So the idea is you're, you may not know it, but you're a walking, talking marketing machine right now. You just have to have it organized and structured, and then it all funnels through the website in a way that's easy for people to navigate, easy for them to digest. It presents you in a favorable professional light that's very appropriate to a rabbi who, who wants to be taken very seriously um, and get more ski, speaking gigs and, and more of what you're already doing now, you know, promoting your books and so on and sorting that out. So do you have any reservations with putting together a marketing plan per se? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that I, I would say not anymore. I would say that there was definitely, you know, there's definitely was part of me and possibly still is that, you know, wanted to think that I could just do this on my own, right? Don't, forced me to write a plan, right? I'm not good with plans. I just want to add with everything. And of course, I've seen the results, right? And but, yeah, but Rabbi, you course, can't do that. hundred percent, right? And I think I've... I, you know that. You know that. You probably have told people that. For times. sure. I, I think that I, you know, have definitely... It, it definitely took me a while. I was, I was fighting that one. And I, now I'm at the point where, yes, I'm like, I'm clear. It, you know, I just need to do this already. You know, I think it, it's interesting because in the moment, and, and I'm sure you've seen this with people you work with and probably yourself, right? In the moment, writing a plan doesn't seem as valuable as doing something in the moment that's going to make you the money. Right? And I know, of course, that it is. Right. Right? But it's, it's, it's again, it's putting together that foundation that will allow everything else to, to be more important. And I've, I've, I've fought myself on that one, and now I'm just at a point of, okay, this needs to happen. Yeah, I mean, you need the foundation, and most people do it. You know what? The, the failure rate for a small business, statistically, is something like 99.9% .9 of all small businesses will go under within 16 months to two years. That's not my opinion. That's the United States Small Business Administration. There are statistics. And the reason for that is not that the people are not good people with kind hearts or that they don't deserve to reach financial self-sufficiency. Far from it. It's that they're trying to do everything themselves, run their business, manage your personal life. And now you have to become an expert in marketing, in advertising, in PR. But now you've got to write blog posts and write them intelligently and articulately in an entertaining way and address it to your ideal customer or client. You've got to add the right links. You've got to add the right SEO. So you need to learn what SEO is and all this and design and social media and what format and images and 
marriages, and on and on and on. The average person doesn't have experience in all of those things. Programmers, some do, but even most programmers are kind of very sweet natured, nerdy guys who don't put all the pieces together. And I don't really apply it to myself. So I'm certainly not above reproach. I don't always apply it to myself. I call it the Hamlet complex. I can see it in others, but I can't always apply it to myself. And certainly, you know, recovering from any addiction or even going, you know, uh, to uh, the synagogue, you've got to put your faith in other things that are bigger than yourself and, and can look at things objectively. Have you had any prior experience in marketing or public relations before this? I've done, I've been in sales for in, in other in other parts of my life. So I, I do have some, some marketing training and I've, I've studied in the personal growth and development world, including some, some marketing and sales training. So I, you know, I, I know enough now to know that I, I, I'm getting to the point where I, I do need to bring someone else on and hire the right people in order to, to make this all work. Well, yeah, I, I just give you some tips and then I want to give you the floor and see what questions you might have for me. And then I can tell you sure. what I think. Sure, happy to hear. Well, basically, as far as digital marketing is concerned, I have, like I said, I work for marketing agencies and publishers and so on for at least 20 years. I don't want to say 30 years because it's going to make me sound even older than I am. But, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. And like I said, putting a foundation and a structure to it is key. Um, I would really have that foundation before, if at all possible. And the good thing is that you're building out the website mm -hmm. now, as you indicated. So that gives you time that you could sit down for a couple of hours and kind of develop a rough draft marketing plan. Would, would you oh, think that sure. would help you a little bit? Would you be Absolutely. receptive to doing that? Okay, I'll tell you what. I If you email me a reminder and just say, Hi, David, this is Rabbi Elon. I will send you a workbook I have. It's called The Road to Digital Marketing Profits. And I'll send you that workbook for free. I won't even follow up with you if you don't want me to. But I'd love for you to look at that workbook and try the exercises see if they benefit you and then give me some right. feedback yeah it's very kind of you i'd be happy to okay i'd love to get your feedback because you would be the first person to really look at this and see is it overwhelming i can do it no i can't i don't get it david you're crazy whatever i'd love to get some input on that so i'd be happy to send it to you and there's no strings attached just tell me your opinion after you uh, read through it or, or try to do it or you may finish it in an hour or two and be like hey man. Um, it really does make a difference that you know your 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 market your seo your branding before you create the site because the reason for that is because once you're clear on these things it makes building the site much easier it's much more difficult to go back after the fact and try to add SEO and change things around once you don't need it, once you have a different opinion. It can come out looking really off or whatever. And you also want how you present yourself in the community, how you present yourself professionally to all match. So for example, my my initials are DMS. I'm a digital marketing specialist. I provide digital marketing solutions. Why am I doing all of that? Because it's easier for people to remember DMS, mm -hmm. right? My, my favorite color is blue, so I'm DMS, not blue. Everywhere I go, I wear blue, be, not because I'm so obsessed with blue or anything. It's just because I'm, I'm terrible with picking clothes that look good. It's like staring in the match. You know, just throw it all together, and at least, oh, there, there's the, the, the crazy blue guy again, those initials. It, it helps a little bit, but... When I build the website, what color should it be? 
blue. What font should it be? The same font that I use in my business card, my pamphlets, my postcards that I send people, my giveaways, everything matches. So it has that feeling of a higher level of professionalism that you see in corporate branding and everything. For does sure. That, does that make sense? You know what I mean? Okay. What kind of questions would you have for me? What questions do I have for you? Well, I would say that... Uh... You know, I, I, I certainly welcome any, uh, you know, any, any any wisdom, any thoughts that you would have. And, um, you know, what 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 would you say are the you know the top three to five things that people have to think about when when building a new website or when putting themselves out into the world? Well, I'm not going to do that with a rabbi on here. Uh, I've, got, I've got some manners, and uh, and I've got Jewish guilt too, so I'm not going to feel bad whatever I say. But seriously, the, 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 like I said, the number one thing that I see do, people do every day, if I go to a networking group, this is what I see 99.9% of They go to one of these so-called free or DIY I don't know. I'm not saying what you do or don't do or what you did. I don't know. The majority of people go and they get a free template. They put it online, has almost no text or content of any kind. And six months go by. They're not getting any phone calls. They may or may not see any connection between the two. I talked to a lawyer uh, about a month or two ago. And I, I actually felt really bad for her because I could feel the pain in her voice where she was an attorney in L.A. And she had two areas of practice. So I'm a very, very well educated woman. She had a free DIY website template. She wasn't getting any phone calls from it. And she was paying somebody to promote the, the, the doggone thing, like $2,000 a month or something. And she's getting not one and she was furious and angry, and which is redundant. But I'm, I'm sitting here talking to her on the phone. At the moment, at that time, I was very tired. And I just said, ma'am, what questions do you have for me? I'd be happy to answer any questions you have as honestly as I possibly can. Big mistake. She asked me all these technical questions. I gave her all the answers. And after that, she just said, I am completely overwhelmed. I don't know up from down. My mind is blown. Hmm. I'm just going to do nothing. And if I have to go get a job at Starbucks, then so be it. I'll go get a job at freaking Starbucks. And you can imagine how that felt for me. I I felt terrible. um, And it was overwhelming for her. So what I tell people now is you get out what you put in and you get what you pay for. Not in all cases, but in many. Um, the reason free DIY templates are free is because it's an empty template. And unless you're a master programmer and digital marketer, you're not going to know what to put into it to make it get attention. So the idea for a website is for the website to represent you online and to be number one in Google. Why would you care about being number one in Google? You know the answer because you'll be deluged with phone calls and emails and work opportunities. And I've done it for myself and I've done it for other clients. And I can tell you when I was in Denver, Colorado, I was number one in Google for web design for several weeks at a time. And I just wanted to see if I could do it. I didn't need to do it, but I wanted to see if I could do it without spending a penny on paid advertising. And I'll never forget a competitor of mine. He was actually a really nice guy. And and I liked him, even though he was a competitor, because he had a very nice personality. And he called me up, and these were his exact words. He called me up and he said, you beautiful bastard, how did you do it? And I said, who the bloody effing, you know, is this? And so he told me who it was. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're number one in Google. He said, there's these corporate entities downtown. You're number one, and they're like number four or five. How did you do that? They're spending three or four grand per day. And I said, really? I didn't even check because it's too stressful for me. And it turned out the way I had reached number 
one was by studying larger industry competitors and changing my SEO to be similar, but not identical to theirs. I was changing my content on a daily basis so that it was similar to them, but obviously not identical. And I was linking to scholarly sites and journals and, and publications like Entrepreneur Magazine or Psychology Today or whatever. So those are some of the ways that you do that. And SEO, for anybody listening who isn't sure, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization and is basically how you outline competitors in Google search results. So it sounds nerdy, but it is vital to being, you know, to just getting your phone ringing off the hook, which is what you want. If your phone doesn't ring, you don't get more customers or clients, you don't make money. And free DIY templates, they don't do that because you know, it's like, it's an empty template. You know, I remember, I don't know if you remember these, if you ever saw them or not, they used to have a machine that would go and print your own business card for like a dollar mm -hmm. or something. You could go to the machine or whatever. And I remember that it would print out the sheet and you would separate the cards from the sheet. It would have the little perforated line around it and everything. And I was in college at the time and I thought it was great. And of course, other people would get the card and look at me like, you know, why don't you just go spend fifteen, twenty dollars, you know, and get a real business card? I didn't know any better. You know, I was watching every little penny. But yeah, you need to have those things together first so you can implement them. So, you know, what font do you want to use that expresses your personality? Are you elegant and classy? Or do you want people to think that, you know, you're speaking to you very directly and simply? Do you want, you know, what kind of person do you want to attract? Who's your ideal client or consumer? You really want to think all these things through. So when you sit down to create the site, you know it in advance. And that's why the DIY thing doesn't work for marketing or for web design. They never show any results um, for that reason. And um, I mean, that's basically it. So it really helps to have all these things worked out before you sit down to begin. You know, it's like going to the racetrack or whatever, not knowing what you're going to bet on, or you know, going to the hardware store without a risk. I, I don't know if those are good analogies or not, but I think you kind of sure. In the my point, right? In, in the recovery room, sometimes they talk about going to a hardware store for milk, and it's like you yeah. doesn't work. Right, yeah. No, exactly. And you could go in there and ask for it or look for it. But, you know, it's like that. what happened with, to me with the lawyer. You know, I felt terrible for her because, look, I can change that for you. I can reverse it for you. But she was emotionally invested in this situation. You know, she was so caught up in I'm not getting the results I want. It's not fair. I'm spending money on these paid ads. But she's basically spending two or three grand per month promoting something that's like mm -hmm. an empty shell. There's nothing to promote. And, you know, if you go to the website, it would have like a photo of her looking very stern, very serious. It's a very poorly lit photo. I wouldn't call her because I feel too intimidated, you know, um, and there's no content. There's no video. things that you're working on and present yourself in such a way. So one of the things that you do is you don't reinvent the wheel. You always look to larger industry competitors and see what they're doing and learn by their example. If I wanted to be a rabbi, I wouldn't start reading the Torah right away and think I'm going to become one myself. I would talk to you and say, what, what should I do? What would be the best approach to achieve this long-term objective? And I know it's not going to be done in 90 days. What should I do? So you want to look to larger competitors. And, you know, I would imagine that um, there are other people, you know, doing similar things just as you are. I would imagine there's other rabbis in New York or L.A. or Toronto, you know, major metropolitan cities, Boston. I'm sure there's, you know, rabbis in major metropolitan hub cities 
who are doing exactly what you want to be doing. And if you can find their websites, you find three or four, and now you know what it should look like. Now you know how it should be packaged. You know what photographs should look like, what content you should be writing about. Right. And the way to find them is go to Google and just type in what you would want to be found for. Now you know what your SEO should be. Unless you want to be found just locally, which is okay and a lot easier to zero right. in on. It, it does. And I'm, I'm, does that make I'm, sense? I'm happy to work. I mean, I have clients that I work with remotely already. So I'm, I'm happy to, you know, have a, have a broader focus than just locally, although local is important too, of course. And um, you'd, you'd probably surpri be surprised. There are, there are very few people in, in this field in terms of working with Judaism and recovery and putting together coaching and resources. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I well, yeah, I, I, with recovery, I could see that there would be not many. Um, but have you ever tried that, just going into Google and just doing a search for what you want to be known for? What is your, you know, truly in your heart? what you really want to be known for the most. If I said, this is Rabbi Glazer, he is the, the nation's leading expert in blank. Right. I mean, what, would, what would it be? I would what say would Jewish recovery, coaching, and, and wisdom. Yeah, I mean, that's I'm what sure I would say, is. is that, you know, if I, I, I want to be known as the Jewish recovery guy. Recovery and in, with. okay, so okay, no, go ahead, I, I didn't fine. interrupt you. I'm sorry. Okay, um, so for recovery, I think it'd be very interesting to go to Google and just type in Jewish recovery or, um, you know, one or two similar terms in Google. Jewish recovery or similar terms that you would use to find who you, know, if you were to appear on on Oprah, but she's not on TV anymore. But you know, you want to look for what you want to be. And I'm sure that there would be at least two websites in the U.S. I'm sure there would be at least two other people, you mm -hmm. know, doing what you're doing sure. it, somewhere in the U.S., either New York or L.A. or maybe Toronto. I mean, if there's not that many others doing it, then that's even better because now you've got a very in-demand area of, of expertise, what we call a niche market. So the, the fewer there are, the better. Um, but it would be helpful that there were you know, at least two or three, and I'm sure that there are. There, there got to be at least two or three other people you know, somewhere in the U.S. or Canada doing it. And... Um, you know, you want to look at them and see what podcasts have they been on, what books have they written, what is their SEO, uh, which you will know from the terms that you use to find them. And whatever their websites look like, yours should look like somewhere in between. If you have three, obviously it should be somewhere between those three. Similar, but not too close, um, you know, for obvious reasons. But I, I think that would be a, a long way toward it. And the fact that you've got so many different areas of interest and things of um, areas of involvement in community, I think are wonderful. Um, and they give you even more ways to promote what it is that you do and how you are unique. And um, yeah, so I would really, really want to organize that so that you're not in a position where you're putting the cart before the horse or just doing, taking random actions and hoping some of these are going to work, some of them won't. You want everything to be firing on all cylinders. Um, and certainly your website should have your podcast. It should have videos of you speaking. It should have a speaker sheet. Um, it should really make it easier for people to hire you for different specific roles and different things that you can be performing both in the community mm -hmm. and nationally. Of course. Do you, do you agree with that? Okay. Okay. Do you have any other 
questions for me that I could help with if they're real technical or, or no, this is this, really this has been helpful. I mean, I think that um, you know it's clear to me that I you know that I've that I've got some work to do here. I think um, you know you you you've given me what to what to focus on, which I which I certainly appreciate, and um, you know it's 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 been. You know, a lot of the things you've been saying are things that I've been, you know, hearing from others and, oh, it's been in the back of my head and it's getting, you know, more and more crystal clear that this, this needs to be a priority. And, you know, that the, the putting the foundation and structure in place will help me grow everything else that I'm trying to do so that I have something to revert back to in a plan and, and can, can work it through with others. And I think that's obviously important. You know what, and, and why you say that, I appreciate everything that you said. I think you're being very, very kind. Uh, there's one or two other things that I would want to say for your for your the, the growth of your business and for its perpetuation. One of the things I've heard people say is, how do I know if I'm getting results that I want? You got to define what success is for you and how you will measure that success. In digital marketing, we call it something called KPIs, Key Performance Indicators. And yes, it's real nerdy, and we can get in, we can see how many people visited your website, or how many people downloaded your ebook or listened to your podcast. But at the end of the day, the bottom line is how many people are hiring you to work with them. So if you're trying something and you're not seeing results, typically within 90 days, that it takes for Google to, you know, pick you up and for things to reset or whatever's going on with what you're doing. Within 90 days, I'd say after within that 90 day window, if 90 days pass and you're not seeing the results that you want, then it's time to press pause and reassess. Why is this not working? Why am I not getting the results that I want? Obviously, the more specific you are in terms of what success means to you, the more likely you are to achieve it. Just like what they say in dating, you know, once you're clear on the type of partner you want, the more likely it is for you to find that person. Uh, you know, when I used to hang out at nightclubs, I met a lot of young ladies, but when I stopped going to nightclubs and said, no, I want to meet someone who's very intelligent and articulate, uh, and, and very matter of fact, so it's kind of like that with, with business as well. So if you're not achieving the success that you want within 90 days, then I would press pause and reassess. Um, as far as budgeting goes, I can answer questions on budgeting, but uh, I don't think you have any questions. Is there budgeting. a magic number you recommend in terms of what a marketing budget should be or sure. how what percentage of our budget should be towards marketing? Sure. sure, absolutely. The United States Small Business Administration, I refer to them for obvious reasons, or the U.S. Small Business Administration, they recommend that a business that is interested in uh, maintaining, just surviving, you invest approximately 7 to 10% of your gross annual revenue Business may continue. Now, if you want to grow exponentially, you reinvest more than that, usually around 15 to 20 percent of gross annual revenue, so you can grow. Not everybody can do that. I get that. And basically, what made Amazon the powerhouse that it is today is that for at least a decade, Bezos put everything he made back into the business. still investing in, in Amazon like crazy, even though they weren't showing a profit. And they may not even be showing a profit today. I'd have to check. But Bezos reinvests everything he makes back into infrastructure. And he would keep buying up more and more warehouses, and they thought he was a lunatic. But he kept buying more and more warehouses, you know, because he's like, look, I know what I'm going to do with them. Whether you know, if you don't see it, it doesn't matter. I see it. So you want to invest number per se other than that a lot of new businesses don't know what 10% of gross annual revenue is for them. 
but you can start with a few grand at least. So, for example, it, it, when you would put an ad in a newspaper, they won't talk to you. They just won't unless you spend at least three grand because to them it's not worth it for them to put an ad in the newspaper, to send it to the printer, and they'll even tell you it should run for several weeks so you can maximize return on investment and get the most phone calls. Studies have shown that people need to see something seven times before they'll act on it. I, I don't know if that's good or bad, depending on how you feel about humanity, but according to research, that's a fact. So the ad needs to run for multiple times before anybody's going to call you. They have to see it, recognize it, think about it, then decide is it worth contacting this person. So you, that, that's why they do that. You have to invest at least three grand or more to put one ad in a newspaper. To put an ad uh, in a local tabloid or weekly, it's going to be the same or more. Radio, which reaches more, well, negligible now. But radio is still more money, and TV is obviously quadrupled that. And Google Ads, to put an ad in Google, um, is basically the same thing. It's basically the same amount of money per month. It's almost identical to that. Uh, but you reach far more people and you can measure it. So that's one way to measure paid advertising online, whether it's Google AdWords or Facebook advertising or LinkedIn. Typically, that's just the way you can move things with a couple of hundred per month. You can, especially with Facebook ads, which is still very, very affordable. But everything else, you're going to want two to three grand per month to, to really move the needle. Google's really good in that they will assign someone to you, or at least they used to, where the, you could actually ask the person questions and they would go over things with you. They would look at your website and tell you what's wrong with it and how you can tweak it and what changes to make so they could promote it even more. Um, so those are really good. And in working with a professional like myself, it's, you're not going to get anything going on a serious level for less than two or three grand as well. So it's, it's not really a magic number, but it's a start. An agency will typically charge five to 10 grand to start, depending on your city and the agency, just because they've got employees and you know, overhead to pay. And typically they're gonna outsource it anyway. They're typically gonna outsource it overseas. That's why you can work for a really big agency and not always get really good results. I knew a woman who was a personal chef. She was like a celebrity chef. She had been on the Food Network. And um, I remember talking to her husband, he was very, very protective. And he was like, well, we spent $30,000 on this website through an agency and we're not getting any leads at all. We didn't think of that. Oops. So the, their site did look really good, but it wasn't getting any results. They didn't, they didn't give that to the agency before the agency began work. So that, that, that kind of answers the money question. Um, and the way to really tell, you know, who you work with, whether it's an agency or an individual, you want to look for professional affiliations and credentials and references or testimonials from clearly verifiable real people. If the testimonials look like, you know, male models and they look like people from magazines, they probably are. You know, so sure. hopefully that's a little bit helpful. Um, but yeah, I think the magic thing is to be organized with what you want and what you're expecting. You know, uh, that, uh, uh, there's no professional developer or digital marketing specialist out there who will not, you know, say thank you God for a client who says, I want these things. I want my phone to be ringing off the hook with new leads. I want to get emails every day for people who want to work with me. I'm willing to pay you what is the industry standard they would be like, this is a miracle. Thank you so much. You know, they'll, they'll kiss your feet, you know, uh, because anybody who's professional is going to love to do that. You know, 
like like a like a happy pig in mud. But it's they're so used to getting phone calls from people who are like, well, I got 150 bucks. What can I get for that? You know, or my free site is not delivering results. What do I do? Um, the other thing I would say is you have a very very specialized niche market, which is great. Use it to your advantage. So. One of the things you can do now while the site is under development is write blog posts specifically about your area of expertise. And a blog post is typically at least five or six paragraphs of content. Usually I'd say between six to ten paragraphs is the best length for a blog post. And you want to include links to scholarly sources and related magazine articles and things like that. Um, and, you know, what they call authority sources or authoritative links and write about your area of expertise because nobody else can do it. And so when your site goes live, you're going to have a blog post ready to publish and then you can have a new blog post scheduled every week on the same date in the same time so that your readers can expect it. Google is kind of automatically going to, um, I don't know what the term is, it's going to, it'll know to look for it, let's put it that way. And, you know, and you can have, you can have fun with it. You can be creative and have related uh, images, you know, and photos. You can have infographic images or diagrams to show what you're talking about. And there's another concept that I want to tell you about, and then I'll, I'll stop. Um, there's a great concept in digital marketing called redistribution, okay, or redistributing. You have a blog post. Let's say that we write, that you write a brilliant blog post about the need for addiction counseling in the rabbinical community. So you've written a brilliant essay blog post on this topic, okay? The next thing to do is if it's appropriate to do a diagram or something like that or an infographic image. You do that. If it's only if it's appropriate. If it's not appropriate, don't do it. Then you do a video where you basically talk about the same blog post, basically touching on the key points and how people can get in touch with you, what related things you may have to add to that. And obviously, you've got a podcast. So your blog post is going to have your text links to scholarly journals, it's going to have the video, it's going to have the image. So you take, you've taken one blog post, you made it into a video, into a podcast, into an image, now you've got the blog post, the video, the podcast, the image, four different things from one, one sit down period. So you've got more to distribute. Now imagine if you wrote 20 blog posts that way, how much more content you would have. So social media marketing, people go to social media marketing and they post one thing every six months. It doesn't do any good like that. It's about, it's about doing it in a repeated, regular basis, using different hashtags, touching on different topics, connecting to different people. So the more content you have to distribute, to more different platforms, the more people mm -hmm. you're going to reach. And also answer questions on forums. You can set aside two hours a week and do that. And you'll be amazed at how much content you can generate for social media, for blog posts, for videos. About every two weeks or so, I'll sit down and I'll go to a website called Quora.com and I'll answer questions. And uh, I'll answer the question that's basically in the form of a blog post. I'll include uh, a diagram illustrating the answer, and I'll do a video too. Then I'll take what I just wrote, I'll rewrite it a little bit, and I'll, now I've got a blog post. I'll take the video, now I've got a video. I'll take the diagram, now I've got a diagram. And if I do 10 of those over a two hour period every two weeks, you know, in the span of several months, I'm going to have more marketing collateral to distribute on social media. I'll have enough for the rest of my life. 
And then you can go to a website like Hootsuite or Buffer, and it will let you automate it. So everything is going like in an automated cycle. Every day, these things are going to these outlets. You don't have to be the one doing it. It does it all for you in an automated way. Nice. So what do you think of everything I said? Is it like too much or not enough? It's definitely a lot. I mean, it, and it, it all makes sense to me. And, okay. you know, I think that um, it's a lot to hold. And it's, you know, I, I suspect that I'll get there. And I think that, um, yeah. you know, these are not my natural inclinations to, to do everything that you just said, which makes sense, which is why we hire people. And, uh, <laughs> right and, and you're not supposed to do everything yourself you know only God can do everything by him or her herself um, you know I, I don't know if God is male or female or a committee it, I think it depends how you look at it. but you know only the creator can do everything people need help and that's why they you know I call the plumber to fix you know the sink you can try to do it yourself you know I remember my dentist once told me that he had somebody come in with uh, who had done their own, uh, tried to like fill their own cavity or something, and the person used super glue. I'm not kidding. The dentist told me about it, and uh, he was a really he was a really uh, cool, you know, informal dentist. Um, but th that's DIY works when it, it's basically if it doesn't matter to you and it's not worth anything serious then DIY is the way to do it. Sure. And I think that's how you should measure it. If it's not that important and it's okay, if it doesn't succeed and I don't have any real concern about it, then DIY can work. If the handle comes off my desk drawer, I can DIY it. If it doesn't work, I don't care. But if it's the sink or the dishwasher or something, I have to call the plumber. I don't know what I'm doing. If I try to do it myself or if my wife tries to do it, it's just not going to work. But you know what I mean? So that's how you measure DIY. And I know that, you know, what I said is a lot, and I can appreciate that. So that's why I always say the way to start is at the beginning. And, you know, I want to encourage you to, you know, just set aside two hours. It doesn't need to be more than that. In fact, it could even be an hour and a half and just sit down and do the workbook and see what you get from it. And uh, I would encourage anybody listening that if you want the workbook as well, email me and I'll send you a copy of it. And all I ask for in return is your feedback. Do you think it was helpful? What are, are there areas that you would like to see or elaborated on or, or whatever? And I'd be happy to send you a free copy no spam afterwards and you know just email me i'll send it to you and all i ask in return is tell me what you thought of it afterwards you can email me at dms at dms.blue and i'll send you the workbook right there and there so I don't forget and certainly for you rabbi um so it, i think you might be surprised by some of the answers um, you get yeah, sure and it, might, and it might be helpful so I want to thank you for being on my podcast. You've been a very kind uh, guest with your time. I feel guilty just talking to you. Um, and um, when we get off of this podcast, please hang around for a couple of minutes so it can download properly and, and we can chit chat off the mic as well. But I, I really appreciate your time. Please tell everybody listening how they may get in touch with you. And what sure. You well, for anyone who like is that, out there struggling with uh, struggling with addiction or recovery issues or wanting to know how to support their loved one while going through it or just interested in any of these topics or really in just in the rabbi faith and spirituality side, feel free to be in touch with me. Rabbi Ilan at TorahOfLife.com. Again, Rabbi Ilan, R-A-B-B-I-I-L-A-N at Torah of Life, T O R A H of Life.com. And I'll be happy to, to connect with you. And of course, the book is available on Amazon and God Created Recovery. And you can find me hosting the Torah of Life podcast at your favorite podcast platform. 
Now, when is your website, your new website? Launched? Yeah, well, the new website will be rabbielon.com, and that'll be up by the end of August. Okay, I'm glad for that, and, and I'm personally looking forward to that. I think that's great. Um, thank you so much for your time, Rabbi, um, and thank you for listening. If you're a struggling small business owner out there, whether it's a nonprofit, you're an entrepreneur, a programmer, an accountant, a lawyer, whatever it is, if you're out there struggling, you know what? Let's jump on the podcast and see if I can help you. The more specific your issues are, the more I can help you, the tougher the questions, the better. Uh, you can go to www.dms.blue slash podcast and just pick a day from the calendar. And it's that easy. And if you need help with your digital marketing or marketing in general, visit me online at dms.blue. And that's the end of this particular episode of Rebooting Business. Obviously, this is when the episode, uh, the podcast was called Blue Monday. Um, so that's, this is the end of this episode of rebooting business. So what did you, what do you think? Did I help the rabbi find ways to reach more of the faithful and increase, uh, members of his, uh, synagogue? Um, was I able to help him? What do you think? Um, so let me know your thoughts and what you think of the podcast as well. So, uh, I'm, I'm always interested in constructive feedback. So thank you for your time watching this. Let me know what you thought. And as always, to get in touch, feel free to reach me at www.dms.blue. Thanks again and have a great day and stay safe out there. I know it's not a traditional domain name, but it's real and it's me. It's as real as it gets. So thank you for listening, everybody. Please be safe out there and uh, be kind to one another. And thank you no, so much. Thanks for having me. Please stick around, okay?